So without further ado, um, we have a special guest in, in the studio. Martin is I, here. I made it. I mean, you, you did make it. I did make it. On, uh, like right at the moment that I think everyone in Austin decided they were going to come home for Fourth of July weekend at the same time. So it was a little, a little bit uh, nerve-wracking. You know, if you'd actually just come to the lecture this morning. Ah, uh, yeah. If you, I had I done here. that, had I done that, but uh, ended up having, which I wanted to go to, and I'm very sorry I missed. <coughs> well, um, we had a lot of fun at your expense while you weren't here, but now that you're good. here, yeah, we're of course well. grateful. This is Martin Wagner, everybody, somebody who used to host the show long before I was even an atheist. That's kind of boggling to Isn't think it? about. I mean, that is really it, strange to think about. It, it strikes me as odd every time I mm. think about it. Yeah. So what have you got for, oh, by the way, I, I mentioned the email address. Um, there's also a few things at the website, including a frequently asked questions page, um, where you can go to find out more about uh, not just the ACA, but atheism in general, atheists, what do we believe, what do we not believe, why, um, but keep in mind that um, as we said about a billion times on this show now, mm -hmm. uh, atheism isn't a dogma. It's not a worldview. It's not a philosophy. There are no tenets. There's no such thing as orthodox atheism, despite some people who'd like to use that label. There's no such thing yeah. as dogmatic atheism. It's simply a rejection of theistic claims. Um, the only reason that, 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 that there's a label for it is because these are important issues. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if people were saying, uh, you know, I believe in Bigfoot and Bigfoot wants me to make sure that you know, gay people can't marry, um, I'd have to call BS on that. Mm, well, that would and I would probably... Be an interesting position for Bigfoot to take. I know. Just sort of like you have to... Well, you know, maybe yeah. we've encroached too much on Bigfoot's land. Yeah. He's trying to stop the spread of this virus of, of human beings. Yeah, because it would, uh, I think, uh, you know, somehow threaten his existence in some yeah. way, gay marriage. Because that's what it does. I, I you know, I, I would be Bigfoot's greatest enemy because, you know, I'm less hairy. There is that, yeah. Yeah, I think that's what yeah. they're afraid of. Right. That's, so that was, by the way, one of the reasons I was a, a, a Christian for so long. Oh, you were more hairy? I was, no, I was convinced that God made a few perfect heads and that the rest of them he put hair on. Ah, well. Mm. I, I later discovered that this was actually supposed to be a joke mm -hmm. and was a flawed argument. Ah. And I got mad at God, and that's why I'm an atheist now. Well, that all makes sure, sure sense. Sure, somebody it, will buy all of that. Yeah. I just, I've, that's probably the best explanation I've heard yet. So you went to TAM, and I already talked about it for like a minute while you weren't here. I went to TAM, yeah. Um, in fact, that's um, having overslept terribly this morning, and so I thought, well, I'll just start and prepare and go through over all my notes and everything. Um, TAM is, uh, just to give everybody a brief who isn't really familiar with the whole thing, it's called The Amazing Meeting, and it's... Uh, a convention, a conference that is now held annually and sponsored by the James Randi Educational Foundation. And so it's a skeptical conference, and um, I thought I'd just wear the t-shirt today from the sort of, you know, rub it in a little bit. Yeah, if you uh, drop the lower third, you can actually see that. Yeah, well, I can just hack it up. It works just as well. Uh, so while it's not strictly an atheist convention, pretty much the, the majority of the people there probably are, you know, what identifies atheist and agnostic. Yeah. And um, I think Hal Bidlack, who sort of always serves as master of ceremonies, I think describes himself as deist. But for the most part, I mean, the, the bulk of the people who speak there and who attend um, are atheists, agnostics, skeptics. And uh, the whole thing is just sort of... Uh, designed as this great sort of central meeting uh, place for uh, you know, a, a group of people, a, a huge community that I think never really realized it was a community before. Yeah. Um, the notion of uh, you know, organizing atheists as just being an exercise in complete futility. It's not, uh, it's not it's, only that, but it's a community that it's really kind of absurd that you would need to unite uh, that kind of community. It is. This is it's we're talking sad. about reality. Yeah, it's sad that you have to sort of, uh, there has to be this uh, sort reality of... Reality-based community. Yeah, the, this this counterbalance to uh, this incredible majority of the human race that just believes in the most absurd notions and you know unfounded uh, ideas. Uh, but w apparently we have to. Uh, one of the speakers uh, there... Um, uh, quite a lot of speakers this year, and it keeps getting bigger every year. By the way, I think they just had over 900 attendees this year, upwards from just over 800 last year. From you know, TAM four was maybe just over 600. So it keeps kind of spreading. And what's what was really great about it this year was when they did a show of hands at the beginning of the conference, just say you know who's the first time, you know who are the first timers here. Uh, most of those hands went up. So you had a whole bunch of people who weren't able to make it back this year, 
but a whole huge flock of folks who came for the very first time and they still beat their attendance records from previous years, right. which tells me that if all of the previous attendees had come plus the newbies, you know, you probably would have had fourteen or fifteen hundred people in attendance. And um, and I think that it's I've spoken to some people who have been to say, you know, American atheist conventions and various other atheist gatherings where they describe the mood as being kind of somber and dour and um, I've never been to one of those. I've never been to the uh, AA convention, so even the one they had here in San Antonio, but where the, I think... Um, There's one coming up here. Yeah, the feeling um, was that, uh, you know, all the, just the fundies are running roughshod and what can we do? And there's, sometimes it can be a feeling of hopelessness sometimes in these strictly yeah. atheist gatherings. Just uh, There is, um, it's, a, it's a bit more upbeat at the JREF Foundation, uh, because a lot of it is, it's not just, it's not about really religion, strictly speaking. It's about all manner of supernatural and superstitious beliefs, you know, what, what, uh, what the skeptics call the woo. And um, so you have speakers ranging from guys like Michael Shermer, who's the publisher of Skeptic Magazine, um, this year's keynote speech was Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, astrophysicist, um, who gave probably one of the most entertaining talks that uh, I think any of us had seen in a long time. He called it brain droppings of a skeptic, and he just went off on whatever random topic came into his mind, um, having to do with you know everything from UFOs to religion to and and, See, now that's... and it was fantastic. It was just so enjoyable and entertaining. And and you know I'm I'm sure it was, and I, I've been a big fan uh, of Tyson's for years. But to me, that's cheating. I don't know. Well, the spontaneity of it was fantastic, though. I, I mean, that he could just, you know, and, and, and he worked the crowd like some sort of motivational speaker. He was just really, really yeah. excellent at it. it um, it's one of the things, you know, we don't do any real prep work for nonprofits. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't. Mm -hmm. Dennis does a lot. He, right. Hey, can we do that again? What if we that just was did? just really cool. Oh, did, we do, did they do a special They did an automatic that? auto camera move that ah. it did that. Do it again. These so, are our... Woo! Goes right into Matt. All right, we right, want we want big sweeping moves like that. That's the closest, anyway, that's the zoom in on Matt special feature that was uh, programmed <laughs> specially for this episode by Sony themselves. But uh, Dennis does a lot of work for the show. Yeah, and and, and Thad brought in some stuff to talk about Tam Six. Right, um, she only bring in news items and, and everything. Mm -hmm. I don't do anything. Right, um, and and I, I guess what I kind of end up doing is um, besides just talking a lot. <laughs> is, Which is fine. Is, fills is up space. Policing and, and, and shifting the conversation around. And that's one of the things right. that, that people like is it's not you know. And this too, this show mm -hmm. too, not necessarily scripted, um, you know. Yeah. And so I can understand why a lot of people really felt great about the kind of speech that Neil deGrasse Tyson gave, mm -hmm. um, because you got to really see somebody's kind of thought processes, I guess. Yeah, there's that, and you know it's. And, and you got to see that you know it's it's this great great counter to uh, this whole notion that you know skeptics are these sort of humorless godless atheists who you know there's there's um, yes we have no oh, fun at all never <clears throat> not not once uh, but uh, but in addition to uh, his little bit which was really sort of extemporaneous um, he had on the other uh, and you had uh, Richard Wiseman uh, who is a scientist who actually investigates things like ESP and paranormal claims in England uh, from a skeptical uh, standpoint. He's a psychologist. And uh, he did this fantastic stunt, which is probably on YouTube by now. You may have to search for it. Uh, but it was the world's largest spoon bending. Yes. Group spoon bending. Um, which, you know, the whole Yuri Geller thing where you kind of rub the spoon and it goes beep, and you, you, supposedly it's all telekinetic. When in fact what you do is you pre-stress the spoon by bending it back and forth a bit, which, you know, oops, sorry, I wasn't supposed to give that trick away. But that's what you do. And, uh, you know, then when you're in front of the TV cameras in the audience, you can just kind of go beep, 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 plop. Oh, look, it fell apart. Sorry, no telekinesis involved, just a trick. Well, what Wiseman did is his little gag was he, uh, you know, did a thing on stage. And then what he did, they actually shipped these from England. I'm amazed they survived. 800 pre-stressed spoons. And they wheeled them out on carts and passed them down all the rows to all the people. And then he did this little thing on stage, and then his video camera panned out to everyone. Yeah. And he had this sort of synchronized little spiel that everyone gave in unison. Some people screwed it up, but that kind of makes it even funnier. And everyone did the spoon bending. 800 people did the spoon bending at once. And it was just a riot. Yep. And the video's uh, up, actually. I got to watch it yesterday. Okay. So. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll try to find that, and I'll uh, you know, maybe like post the embedded on the AE blog so people can watch it, because it's really funny. Um, but it's all about how the brain sort of tricks you into thinking that th things are happening that aren't really happening. And, and what it is that people notice, some people ha have a knack for noticing certain things, 
and you don't notice other things, which is why the misdirection and, and the deception is so easy a lot of times. Um, he had another uh, video that he played that's been up on YouTube for a while, which is his amazing color changing card trick. Um, where it looks just like sort of your standard little card stunt where they flip a deck where someone says, well, here's pick a card, and then he put it back in the deck, and then he does this little deal, and he's, then when he reveals, oh, is this your card, and then he pulls it out. But now the entire deck except, except for that card, the backs have all changed colors. They've gone from red cards to black on the backs. Um, and you're watching that going, hmm, okay, well, a little card trick. But what you don't realize, or what a lot of people don't realize, some do, it all depends on how you notice these things, is that the entire trick is it's like two people sitting at a table, him and his assistant, uh, and it's all done in one take with sort of zoom ins to certain details at certain right. points. So I'll go into him, then to his assistant, then to the surface of the table. And while all these zoom ins are taking place, stuff's happening off camera, like the girl's changing her shirt, and they're changing the color of the backdrop here from, I think, blue to green or whatever. And, they're cha and they even pull the tablecloth off. They'll go and do a close-up of Wiseman, and the whole tablecloth gets ripped off to reveal a different color tablecloth beneath right. that. And these are the things that a lot of people watching the video, I watched it right, I didn't notice. I at one point I noticed, I thought there was something strange about the girl's shirt. I thought this video looks like she's wearing some kind of Star Trek shirt or something. What's the deal with that? But it didn't, but most of the people watching that video don't get that while this fairly lame conventional card trick is going on, everything in the environment that you're seeing is changing and you're not getting it. And uh, that's, so, that's an aspect of, I think, psychology that Wiseman finds fascinating. And I think it's how a lot of these, these you know, the woo crowd is able to, uh, well, certainly it's how stage magicians work. Yeah, but and there's, the, there's, a, there's kind of an interesting problem with that, too, in that there are some things that you can change because mm -hmm. um, the way our brain works and, and processes the picture, some things are less important than, than another. I mean, if, mm -hmm. if we panned over to Martin and came to, back to me and I kept on talking and I had this huge clown multicolored yeah. wig on, everybody's going to notice that because it, it's a dramatic change that is, you know, it's, it's, it's I, my face is hopefully... Uh, where you're looking and you're not, you know, staring at a blue bank blank background. Ignore me. Um, there are a number of times where magicians have incorporated um, outfit changes into their mm -hmm. act. Yeah. Where you'll have, um, you, you know, they they put the magician in a box. They close the box. The assistant gets up on top and she's wearing, uh, uh, you know, a red outfit and she mm -hmm. raises the curtain. It drops real quick. The magician's up there. He opens the box and she steps out and she's got, you know, a white outfit on. Mm -hmm. Now there's a couple of problems with this. One, there's a significant portion of the population that don't notice that in addition to changing places, she changed outfits. Mm -hmm. It's just, oh yeah, there's the girl. The other thing is that some of them who do notice say, oh, well, it's just a different girl. I mean, you know, they brought a different, you know, dirty. Yeah. And so it, it kind of, it's, it's almost there, I have to think, um, specifically to entertain magicians who already oh, know sure. the yeah. trick. And, and go, yeah, you know, she did a, a good, you know, uh -huh. soup change or whatever else. But, I mean, there are things that we just don't notice all the time. Yeah, yeah. Well, Wiseman, I think, did a, a similar little gag, I think, two years ago at TAM, which I didn't attend, where he sort of, uh, he was in the middle of a spiel, and um, he popped off stage for a second, said, I'll be right back, I'm going to get something. And, he, and then Phil Plate came on, you know, and he it it was wearing the same outfit. They're, they look very similar. Phil's a little taller, but they're both like these bald guys with glasses, right? Yeah. And, and it was like a minute before someone was like, hey, that's Phil Plate, and it just brought the house down. So, um, you know, and Phil came out acting like Richard with his hilarious accent and all the rest of it. So, you know, a lot of this sort of misdirection and sort of, you know, messing with your mind thing, of course, it's all, it, this is what stage magicians do to make their living. But uh, the message is that this is what a lot of these, you know, the, the, the woo practitioners do, the people out there who oh, are yeah. really trying to, you know, people like, um, um, you know, Yuri Geller, of course, and, and, uh, and then there's the uh, <coughs> the cold reading that the you know the folks like uh, John Edward, uh, who was is appearing I think uh, this month at uh, the same hotel where Tam was held, that's what they do, um, and there there are lots of photos from Tam of of people you know, kind of being rude to the posters of John Edward, uh, posted up all over the hotel, so um, you get a large variety of of speakers that go on. Uh, talking about all manner of different stuff. You know, not everybody's as good as everyone else. Some people are very natural in front of a big group of folks. Uh, some other people are, you know, maybe a little bit not used to public speaking in big groups. Uh, but they're still interesting all the same. Um, and there's uh, the fellow who helped um, uh, Randy expose Peter Popoff, the 
televangelist, the faith healer, you know, who uh, really raked in a whole lot of money in the 80s, you know, doing his... And is back at it again. Making more than ever before. This yeah. is kind of the depressing one. Essentially what uh, Peter Popoff did was he, he was this guy who, you know, did the kind of the whole Benny Hinn routine. As I'm here. He didn't bring him up on stage. He would go out in the crowd. He'd go into the crowd and find folks and goes, where, where is Louise, you know, from, you know, uh, West Virginia? Yeah. And... He, People would be like, ooh, he knows all this stuff about me. Well, he's got a bud in his ear, and he's, and he's getting transmissions from his wife, who's behind stage, because before his little evangelical rally, his rally, his faith healing performance, they would fill out cards. The attendees would fill out cards. And then his wife, Peter Popoff's wife, will go out into the crowds and just socialize with folks. Hi, where are you from? So and so, what's wrong? And, and just get to, and, and, and the conversations that she was having before the uh, rally with those people we're being transmitted to folks behind the stage who are writing this information down. Right. And so he's getting, and so um, what Randy and uh, his team did was they got in and um, with this sort of surveillance equipment, you know, pegged the frequency and recorded it. And then Randy went on Johnny Carson, who was a fantastic uh, uh, supporter of skepticism. And, uh, and you just, you're not going to see his like on, you know, commercial television ever again, I don't think, in terms of supporting that kind of thing. And what's depressing, though, is that, you know, it took the wind out of Peter Popoff's sails for a little while, and then he kind of came back. And yeah. whereas in the 80s, at the time he was exposed, you know, he was racking in something like $11, $12 million a year. Now he's up to $24 million a year yeah. and doing the same crap. So people just don't learn. It's this really sick and depressing exploitation of hope and, and insecurity and sadness that these religious vultures... Uh, um, prey upon that is yeah it just kind of makes you you just kind of go wow yeah, it's, the, it's, the thing is is that so. if 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 nobody else were doing this mm -hmm. um, and you expose Peter Pop up pop up despite the fact that the people tend to have short memory um, I don't think he could have built back up again mm -hmm. the reason he's been able to rebuild his ministry and come back stronger than ever is because what he's doing is playing on things that people already believe and other people are doing so religion has within it already pre-built in this mechanism of uh, forgiveness for one thing, <laughs> yes. which is, you know, I mean, I can't count the number of televangelists we've seen, you know, getting caught busted with, you know, hookers and drug dealers and whatever, and then come on and, you know, turn on the waterworks like crazy. Yeah. Then they disappear for a little while and then they work their way back and... God has healed me from the former asshat that I used to be, yeah. and now I'm a true man of God, which means I need even more of your money. Yeah, God has forgiven me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> God, in, fairness, in this though, case, being... his ministry may not be doing quite as well. I, I, think, I think we'd have to adjust the dollars. No, no, they showed his taxes for last year. No, but I mean $11 million in 80 versus Oh, well, I mean, you know, if you count for inflation and what have yeah. you, but still $24 million bucks yeah. is more than... Right. It's more than I make. Yeah, it's, and it's more than he should... It's be. more than everybody in this building makes yeah. together. Well, it's it's twenty four million more than he should be making. Yes. I mean, you know, he should be, uh, you know, working. But I mean, it's, selling insurance somewhere. It's I mean, it's the, no... one of the problems. The, the, one of the reasons why we do this, you know, not not just to. It's not like I'm out to mm -hmm. steal away hope from people or take away their religious belief. Would I prefer that people relinquished superstition and religious beliefs in favor of a reality based worldview? You betcha. Yeah. And I'll do everything I can um, to encourage that. Because people say that a lot to skeptics. They're like, well, why do you want to take away people's hope? Yeah. And it's like, think about what you're saying for a minute. What sort of hope is false hope? What sort of hope is just a bunch of lies, comforting lies that have been built on? Because all that happens is, you know, the more of that you build up, then when reality really hits you, the fall is that much harder. Now, some, you know, and I've talked to other, you know, atheist friends of mine, and they, they, don't necessarily agree that that's strictly the case, and I see they have a point. I mean, if you look at something like religious beliefs or superstitions uh, as, say, a big house of toothpicks, and reality is this thing that comes along and just keep pokes, keeps poking holes in the house of toothpicks, well, what the usual believer does is just pile on more toothpicks. Um, ultimately, though, I think for a lot of people, you run out of toothpicks, and the choice then is either, well, you just have this house of toothpicks full of holes, and that you're clinging to, you know, for some reason, or I don't want to, like, strain this metaphor beyond the breaking point, but um, I think that it's just... I wish I had a toothpick. ...weird that... <laughs> that was just it so completely random, Mr. Cost statement. 
<laughs> That's I like be. turtles. All right. So the contest for this episode is come up with a, write your own folk song saying, I wish I had a toothpick for Matt. And next week on the show, we'll play it. Yes. Uh, I'm toothpick free. By the way, the yeah. telephone number's up on your screen now. You can call it at any time to talk about this or whatever yeah. else you want to talk about. As I mentioned before, specifically, if you've got some particular belief or if you think that, you know, um, I don't know, atheists have, have yeah, and, but while we're uh, yeah, and, But while we're, you know, waiting for the call strike up, I do yeah. want to say, you know, just if you're an atheist or an uh, unbeliever, skeptic, what have you, um, this is absolutely something to go to. I mean, just for, um, first off, the parties are beyond belief, but so it's a wonderful social, um, you know. Uh, Evidently, there's a, there was a very popular drink whose name we won't say on today's show. Just That's so right, that we don't, yeah. You yeah. know, blow our chances of being shown in the afternoon. Oh, yeah. But all I kept hearing was how everybody kept drinking these, and I don't know, I'm not sure how they remembered the name of it. But. Yeah, yeah. I, I heard about it. I think I kind of avoided that. Um, I think it may have, oh, I'm not sure if that was being uh, sort of passed around at the skeptic party right around the time that the Caesar's Palace, the security, broke the party up because it was too cramped and too loud. I fled that party a little bit before, just because the room was such a sauna. Um, this a big hotel suite, but there were something like 300 people in it, and you literally couldn't breathe. It was so hot. So myself and my little entourage, we kind of skipped out, and then I think at that point uh, was when they got shut down. So I don't know if everybody had just been, you know, guzzling those, uh, but uh, it's entirely possible. But just in addition to all of that fun, um, just as a way to go and meet a bunch of uh, just fellows from around the world, Everywhere, yeah. and this is when I have to give you know my hello and my shout out to the Australians. Ah, and Al I did that last week. On yes, <laughs> Alan and Lloyd and Rachel, the ultimate fangirl, were there, and they were fantastic. We hung out the whole time. They're great, biggest AE fans ever in Australia, and this is still what boggles me ever since I you know when I was host, um, you know four years ago when I left the show. It was you know we weren't on Google and uh, YouTube, and the internet really wasn't doing what it was doing now, and. Um, you know, just all these viewers and from around the world just didn't exist at that time. You know, you might get like one email right. every six weeks from some local guy, but you know, now it's you know back on the TV mailing list and it's just being bombarded with fan letters from people like you know, hi, I'm in Finland. I'm like, yeah. uh, but uh, it was fantastic meeting the Australians and I look forward to seeing them again next year. But just to go and meet, um, you know, just prominent names in the skeptical community. I talked to PZ a lot, PZ Myers and Ferengula blog. Um, Phil Plate, you know, Mike Shermer, and James Randi, who's the most, you know, just sweetest, most approachable little guy you could ever meet. Um, you know, it's, it's an expensive little vacation, but completely worth it, you know. So I would just say start saving now, um, you know, because it'll be one that you don't want to miss. And it's just a great way to sort of boost your morale as a skeptic, to make you really want to get out there and tell folks, you know, you know look, yeah. this, is, this is why it's important. Well, one of the one of the questions that we get a lot is attitude. why why would you guys do this? I mean why why would you have an atheist group because they're they're thinking in the mindset that this is kind of like uh, church on some level um, it may be because really we're all social creatures and mm -hmm. some of us appreciate company uh, more than others but being around people uh, who you genuinely like who you want to share ideas with have conversations with share experiences with have a dinner with, go out on the lake. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Th this is, uh, in that sense, um, if that's all church is to you, cool, keep on going. And in that in that case, yeah, welcome to the first atheist church of Austin. <laughs> but if you're talking about it as, um, as a raw substitute for um, Sunday morning worship, um, it's a substitute with no worship of all, at all of anything. Yeah. Um, I know you've got one other thing that we want to talk about a little bit, but there's one caller on the... Oh, yeah. I can be sort of going can... back and forth between the calls, talking yeah. about different things that went on at TAM that I thought was interesting. But uh, so, yeah. so we got... Is it John? Hi, you there? Hello, John. Hello. Hi, you're can on. Can you hear us? Are you there? Yeah, we, we can hear you just fine. I'm holding on to the TV set, I believe. You I believe? believe I saw an article in the paper this morning about heaven and hell. Okay. Did you? That the Pew Research Group uh, took. Did you see it or read it? I, I didn't read this morning's paper. You know who wrote it? It's just an article in the paper about Michael Paisden of the Boston Globe wrote it. It's a review of this survey. And it essentially says 78% of the people believe in heaven. Mm -hmm. And 59% believe in hell. Now, I don't know statistics very well, so 
Mm-hmm. I don't understand the gap here. Well, you know, inconsistencies in religious belief, what a surprise. Um, and, and another I, thing in, I, the, in the tail end, and I'll shut up and wait for your answer. Okay. They made a big deal about why God, whether God is good or it, whether he's a revengeful, about the punishment, why bad things happen. Mm-hmm. They made a big deal out of that. So anyway, go ahead. I enjoy your show. And, uh, Thanks. Uh, I just got back from Roswell to the spook, spook convention. No, go ahead. <laughs> Thanks a lot, John. Appreciate it. Yeah, uh, I didn't actually read the, the Statesman article this morning, but I did mm. see the Pew Report. It, it, there's a lot of interesting data coming out of this. Um, one, if you take your statistics about how many believe in heaven versus how many believe in hell, mm-hmm. um, I'd say that in addition to the gap, it, I bet if you went to those people who believed in hell, none of them think they're going. Yeah, there's... Uh, it's. We, we, we tend to kind of, it's, I, I don't want to oversimplify things and say, yeah, because I don't believe that we choose our beliefs. I believe you're either convinced of something or you're not. However, you, your personal likes, dislikes, preferences, um, those do color the process you use to decide whether or not a claim is believable or not. And so the idea that you would be rewarded um, with some kind of pleasant afterlife is incredibly appealing. And the yeah. idea that you might be punished is not so appealing. However, it's appealing that someone else might be punished <laughs> yeah. for wronging you. Somebody so that may all explain, them liberals. <laughs> yeah, that may explain the disparity. Um, also, I was getting a note that 70% of Americans believe that there are multiple paths uh, mm-hmm. to heaven. And, yeah. you know, I, I'm, I, I don't well, know why anybody thinks The fundamentalists will not be happy to hear place. that. Yeah. Well, there's, uh, they, because like you just said, they want uh, there well, to be one, right? I think that I would, um, maybe this is just sort of a, a difference in the slight semantic details, but I think that to, to the degree that preferences, as you said, play a role, I think people do choose what they believe, whether or not their beliefs are entirely sincere, like whether or not like you actually got them behind the eight ball and they had well, to that's put, what talking about. put what they believe into practice. I think most people claim to believe certainly a great many things solely for the reason that those beliefs provide them some you know, kind of emotional security blanket. I think they can choose to claim a belief. Yeah. I think they can choose to act as if they believe something. Yeah. But when you get down to brass tacks about whether or not you actually they really, really believe, believe it, it is, I don't think that that's choice-based. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, we live, in a, we live in a very comfortable culture that I think allows people right. never to have to be sort of put in that position sure. of, you know, really think, well, do I really, really believe this? Plus you've got something nobody can, oh, you can't prove me wrong. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm secure in my beliefs because you can't prove me wrong. Sure. So it, there's that coupled with, you know, the fact that no one's taught critical thinking in our culture, right. in our educational system, it's just about everyone's scientifically illiterate. This was one of the more, um, I think, disturbing and, and bleak talks at TAM. It's Sharon Begley from Newsweek. Um, one of the things that was kind of interesting about this, Tam, is that the theme is uh, ostensibly um, skepticism in the Internet age. And yet very, very few of the speakers actually focused on that. There really wasn't a whole lot about, you know, even PZ when he got up, you know, who's like the top science blogger just about. And he didn't talk about his experiences as a big atheist blogger. He, he, he gave a, an Evo Devo lecture. You know, it was like being in his biology class. Interesting. But, you know, he sort of got up and he prefaced it with saying, uh, well, I bet you're all expecting me to, you know, eviscerate some Christian. And, no, oh, sorry. And he just gave a straightforward science lecture. So very people focused on the theme. But Sharon Begley from Newsweek uh, actually gave a talk that may have been more e- appropriate even at last year's TAM, where the theme was skepticism in the media. And she essentially showed a whole bunch of figures uh, pointing out, well, here's the problem. Most Americans are pathetically scientifically illiterate. And don't expect the mass media or the news media, or whatever you want to, you know, however you want to phrase it, to come to the rescue in terms of thinking, yes, well, it's in people's interests that we make sure that they're all right, of it, that we all have the facts here, and yeah. uh, in correcting uh, people's really, really bad lack of skepticism and um, tendency to believe just the most pathetic rubbish. Um, and so that kind of was very sobering. It sort of showed us all just how far we have to go. I mean, something like uh, maybe nearly 20% of American adults still think the sun revolves around the earth. You know, I mean, that's just when you want to, you know, sink your face yeah. in your hands. And, and uh, uh, so, you know, until we sort out science education in this country, I think that we're not only going to have a problem just with that, people being really, really stupid about basic facts at a basic level. 
but we're running a risk of falling very, very, very far behind the rest of the world in terms of, you know, the, tw the 20th century was the American century. The 21st century probably will not be if we're no longer the leaders in science. No, I think, I have, no longer I, think the, I have a potential solution. And that is? Do tell. I remember when I was in school, um, in my, in, I don't know, whether it was a, an English lit class or, or just, I don't even remember what labels they put on it. My, mm -hmm. my school was rather abysmal. But you had these books that you were required to read and then report on. Mm -hmm. And you had, you know, whether it was Huckleberry Finn or the Scarlet Letter or whatever classics. Let's replace one of those. Mm -hmm. And let's make Carl Sagan's The Demon Haunted World required reading for every kid. At least they'll get some introduction mm -hmm. into the beauty of science, the usefulness of critical thinking, um, the the responsible uh, skepticism that should be expected of all of us. Mm -hmm. And it is, in fact, a, a great book. Uh, you know, well yeah. written, it's an enjoyable read. It's, so why not make the required, I mean, you know, Scarlet Letters, uh, okay. I, I got one on my sleeve. Melodramas, yeah. But, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a start. We, uh, another speaker from TAM, Richard Saunders, who is a... Uh, um, Suspenders. Yes, suspender man from uh, Australia, Australian skeptics. He demonstrated this thing. He, he does a thing where he actually goes around to these grade schools and does um, a dowsing demonstration. You know, he'll get, a, and at TAM he had a bunch of, and this actually was something I was very happy about. Quite a few people there in, in attendance who were teachers. He had a bunch of teachers come up and he did his little dowsing demonstration where he, it's just very simple. You've got five plastic buckets and under one is the thing of water. Oh, which one is it? And so let's see if our dowsing rod can find it. And, um, you know, it's all just, if you know where it is, then, you know, you'll just sort of do it. Yeah. Right? And, uh, but, uh, you know, it's not a thing. If you, you suddenly you make the guy turn around and close his eyes and then you sort of do the little, you know, shell, shell game deal, with them, then it's not quite so reliable. And that's just a very, very simple way to communicate to kids. It's just a primer. Get them realizing, hmm, you know, maybe I should think about these things that I keep hearing, you know, like the crop circles and the dowsing and the what have you. So Today's lecture actually kind of does in, dovetails into that nicely because mm -hmm. one of the things that Professor Coker was talking about was um, he's not a parent or, or mm -hmm. a grandparent or anything, but how can parents and grandparents get their kids involved with this? Mm -hmm. And there were a number of really good ideas that, that he did as fun projects. And he started with, um, let's say, UFO pictures. And uh, he won't allow digital cameras for the project. But if you took yeah. a regular film camera, uh, you know, make it as a, as a project. We're going to create, try and create the most realistic, that's not even the right word now that I think about <laughs> it, but the most convincing UFO mm -hmm. photograph that we can with just a camera and things around the house. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it be chucking a hubcap up in the sky. And Which is the easiest way to do it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and do the same thing and do the same thing for like, you know, Loch Ness Monster, Bigfoot, ghost pictures, you know, things like that. Projects that, that you can get kids involved in that are fun, Mm -hmm. that teach them something and that build critical thinking skills. And so that maybe, um, even if this isn't something that they greatly enjoy or that they, you know, run off to become a, a debunker or scientist or whatever, um, maybe when somebody comes up to them in their, in their teens or 20s or 30s or 80s um, with a photograph uh, to try and mm -hmm. have them buy into some kind of, you know, oh, look at this picture of ghosts, you know, oh, that's not yeah. ghosts, that's, th those orb things are just a reflection. I can think of another way to, to take that experiment to the next step that will really kind of hammer that message home, which is after you've had the classroom of kids do all of their fun little fake photographs, do something like go to a shopping mall and, um, you know, set up a little display or something and just ask passers-by, okay, um, do you think this is real? You know, or which of these, here are five UFO photographs, uh, which, which is the fake one? You know, without them knowing that they're all fake. You know, but they're saying, which is the fake one, right? Now that may be a little bit leading, but you know, still a person who sort of knew what he was doing would be like, well, I think they're all fake. You know, or someone might be, mm, you know. Something like that, or lead, and, and then get the kids understanding, oh, wait a minute, it's really easy to fool just your average person. Yeah, I think, I think it's one of the I reasons. I know that my photo's fake, and yet this person thinks it's real. One of the things you yeah. find um, across the board mm -hmm. in the skeptic community, in the atheist community, um, and we've talked about this before, magicians. Mm -hmm. 
all over the damn place. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Rory Coker worked on some effects and wrote some books, magic related. Mm -hmm. um, I've done it. You had Penn and Teller and, and Jamie yeah. and Swiss Penn and Tell her there. Yeah. and Wiseman and all of these people who Benichek. are professional or amateur uh, magicians who were brought up uh, with an interest in mm -hmm. learning to, to fool people yeah. and began to really see how easily we can fool basically ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, I won't go into too much detail on it, but it's one of the things that I've been working on for another lecture. But yeah. um, we fool ourselves all the time. Wiseman gave, Wiseman's demonstration about how observant we are, yeah. the things that we miss, the changing color of the background, etc. Um, that's a good example. Mm -hmm. People are like, ah, oh, you know, magicians. They, they, I mean, and magicians are are incredibly the good ones, precise, um, almost. OCD anal people <laughs> when it yeah. comes to plotting out the movements, whether even just simple hand movements. There needs to be a reason for it. It needs to be done in this particular way. Oh, yeah, you have to and do that. Because and, and it's not so much that they're trying to find a way to fool you. Mm -hmm. They're trying to find a way to do something where you can fool yourself. Right. To where an, an action that looks normal draws no suspicion and actually does you know something. Right. Famous. I mean, if you don't have sort of the willing mark, as it were, um, it's not going to come off. Right. And so first what you have to do is um, bypass maybe whatever minute latent skepticism that person will have, win their confidence over, but then completely control their attention to such a degree that you can literally do things right in front of their faces and yeah. they won't notice it. And, but the only way you can do that is if they make the choice to say, okay, I, tr I trust this, or at least I'm interested, in, I know this guy's a stage magician, so I know he's going to do tricks to me, but this is interesting, and so I'm going to follow along. That's the part that I find cool. most interesting, is yeah. that people will go to a magic show knowing that the guys are intentionally trying to deceive you mm -hmm. and will walk out just completely baffled. And some of them, as bad as this sounds, will walk out actually believing that this person has done something supernatural. Yeah, uh, that's a little alarming. Yeah, um, no matter, you know, it's, I've had, I'm, I'm not great, and I haven't been doing things, you know, really in years, but I remember, no kidding, there were times in the Navy where I'd be sitting around doing a card trick and I do one that was um, not like a pick a card find a card but mm -hmm. uh, more of a visual kind of shocking something that looked like what we would imagine real magic which is a bad term too yeah uh, to look like and I literally had guys say uh, you're the devil and, and, <laughs> and walk out and it's like, you know, okay, I'm not going to show you how I do And this, this you're in the Navy, so these men, like, yeah. are defending our nation, and they have high-powered weapons. Yeah. And they're, ye, okay. And yet they're, well, you know. But, you know, we've got pilots who step onto planes, or won't step onto planes, without their lucky charms. And I'm not talking about the breakfast cereal. Yeah, well, that lucky uh, charm will do a uh, real lot of good if they get a sort of heat-seeking air-to-air -air missile at their ass. Yeah. So, anyway. But you're right about that. It's the, the, um... The misdirection has to be precise, and I've, I've, I have a really good, one of my old high school buddies is a, does close-up magic, like Jamie and Swiss does, and um, I remember uh, being back at home, this is when I was married, and I was sitting, uh, he was doing a trick for my wife, she's sitting right next to me on the sofa, and he was literally as close to her as I am to you, and he's doing this routine with just, I think, some doodad, maybe like a ring that she had or something, he gave her to do the, and he made the whole thing disappear with the da-da, and, uh, but he has her attention completely under his control. She doesn't realize it, so she's entirely watching the hand that's supposedly doing the trick. Now, after making the ring disappear, which is, you know, I think the usual French drop or what have you, where you just, it's in this hand, not that one, this sort of thing. What he does while he's talking to her and he's giving, giving her the spiel, he takes his other hand and he literally lobs the ring over her head over my head, and it lands on the sofa behind both of us. Now, I see all this because he's not doing the trick for me. He's doing it for her. She never notices, not once. It's a pretty flamboyant, I mean, it's a lob, right? I mean, you can't. But he does this right in front of her. She never notices. So I just, I take the ring myself. I think, well, I'll play along. And I put it, I put it in my shirt pocket. And he says, now I'm going to make that ring reappear in Martin's pocket. And I pull it out. And she's just like, bleh. You know, she never was, but it just that much control to where they can be that close to you and manipulating you. So yeah, if once you realize what's going on, is it any surprise that, you know, people with even more insidious uh, motives, like the Peter Popoffs of the world and the Benny Hens and, and the evangelists and the people out there 
say in India who are trying to be, yeah. play like we're God men and we do all these healings and what have you. I can knock and, you over with my chi and the taser that I've yeah. secretly <laughs> hidden up my sleeve. I mean, when you take uh, people's, how, how easy it is to manipulate folks psychologically, their attention, you marry that to an audience that is primed to be deceived or not to be deceived but just to have a certain desire met, an emotional right. need or a psychological desire met. And now you're getting into, say, Sylvia Brown territory, right. where what she does is so obviously fake and egregiously manipulative, but you have an incredibly emotionally vulnerable person. They may, again, if what they, between what they really believe and what they're just saying they believe to sort of hide behind a security blanket, as it were, the point is they want to believe that their dead mother is trying to talk to them. They want to believe that their dead child is happy in heaven with God or whatever. Yeah. And so at that point, it is just so easy for some sick, sick, sick vulture like yeah. these Sylvia Browns and John Edwards to just play on that. And you might say, well, it doesn't do any harm. I mean, she made the woman happy. And I'm like, no, no, no. I mean, no, that's just pure exploitation. And that doesn't help the emotional healing process. If I mean, you don't think there's anything wrong with it, Let's pretend for a minute, and, and I realize, okay, th some th things are separated by time, but let's say that your, your parent just died, and some nasty crone comes walking up to you at the funeral and tells you that, I just got a message from your parent. They wanted me to tell you that they love you. The, this type of thing happens at some funerals I've been to where somebody is uh, offering their platitudes. But why are they talking to contact yeah. you and not me? Um, I mean, yeah, and and why don't they say something useful? I already knew my parents loved me. I know they're dead. Um, why why did they come to you, and why didn't they give you anything useful? And why um, would you come to me with something like that? I mean, I, at a at a point where uh, I'm grieving these these people, these psychics who pretend to talk to dead people, um, they're just they're taking people's emotions and screwing them up and implanting basically false memories well, yeah, to well, some they're, degree. They're vultures and they do it for fame and they do it for money. I mean, yeah. that's what Sylvia's about. You get something, you, you, you pay her something like $750 for a 20 minute phone reading. Yeah, and, and, um, a, a 20 minute phone. And that's message. a sickening thing. It's just exploiting the emotions uh, and you know, for, for monetary gain, really. Well, we gotta um, hold that thought for a second. Yeah, 